you know, there's still stuff I'm, I'm going to want to do after I'm done. Like, you know, the work ethic and everything you put into this thing isn't just going to go away. You're going to have to transfer that to somewhere else. You've been advising in this health sports tech ecosystem, some of this technology is potentially helping you perform better on the court. You know, when you sign all these like agents and management companies and stuff like that, you know, you kind of put those people to work and kind of look for these companies and opportunities and stuff like that. So, you know, you're taking 3% of my contract. So it's like, you know, I started doing a lot more networking my last year at, at Stanford. And then, you know, you get to the NBA, it's a bigger platform. I feel like too many people wouldn't take my call now have you ever thought about building a health tech startup yourself one day you know i just i know there's a huge learning curve which i'm trying to slowly slowly diminish the the dream after that would be yes running my own business running my own startup that's actually you know impactful Welcome, welcome, man. NBA fans are about to love this one. This is another episode of the Athletes and Assets podcast. I'm your host, Noah Lack, and I bring on your favorite athletes to chat about entrepreneurship. And man, we got a good one today. We got Rook in the building, and Denver Nuggets rookie Spencer Jones, former all-time leader in three-pointers made at Stanford. You know the guy's smart, man. Chilling in Denver right now. Spencer, thanks so much for joining us, brother. How are we doing? We're doing great, man. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no doubt, man. You know what we do on here, man. We skip the small talk. I got to tell you, Spencer, like, you are one of the more fun guys to play on scout team. Because uh, when Santa Clara plays Stanford every year, it's like, if you're Stan Spencer in practice, every time you get the ball, just shoot it. <laughs> just funny. jack up a three. It's even more fun. Than, it's even more fun when the actual player playing that way. And, you know, having the ultimate green light and stuff like that. So. It's so one thing hopefully I can build with Denver in the next couple of years, but it might take me it might take me some time. I mean, you know, I wouldn't take that for granted because, like, you know, my thing was like, you know, in the Jared Haas era, um, great guy. Like, you know, not everyone has the green light. You know what I mean? It's not it's not a democracy here. You know what I mean? And so, like, not every guy on Stanford is allowed to just shoot any shot. But um, as the all time leading three point um, scorer. At Stanford, like, yeah, you must have had a, a neon green light. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Especially, I think it really started at, I really started noticing after, like, my second year, you know, your older guys, like, junior year, stuff like that. Like, coach is like, yeah, you literally can pull kind of whatever you want. But, like, naturally, you know, my IQ and my game, it was like, he knew, uh, he knew he, he could tell me that and I wouldn't go off the rails just because, you know, I always like to find the best shot within the, within the team, within the scheme and stuff like that. So it was, it was both like, you know, like him giving me the confidence, but also knowing like I had my own restraints with it. So. Yeah, no, for sure. I was excited when we played y'all. I'm like, make me Spencer. I'm hey, Hey, give me the ball. This is my time. This is my Super Bowl. <laughs> but I, I remember in your offense, Spencer, um, at that time, um, it would either be Maxine or you catch the ball on top. And then the guard comes and does a cut behind the big on the top of the key. I'm like, what is the point of this cut? I thought y'all's offense was super weird, but uh, I guess it worked a little bit for you. Yeah, no, it, I kind of I kind of liked how our offense was because now it, it, I, I kind of see how uh, it kind of, you know, developed itself from a lot of these NBA offenses where a lot of it's spread out, you know, especially when you have a guy like Jokic too, you know. You know, that was good playing with Maxime because he was, he was also very skilled and, and we used him in a variety of ways. So, like, you know, learning how to play off him is kind of translated into kind of lear learning how this offense runs around, around Jokic with, with spacing and, and constant movement with guys. You know, when you have, you know, when you have a, a guy that can literally, you know, find you anywhere with eyes in the back of his head, it's kind of wild. Has Jokic, has Jokic put Skittles in your car yet? I mean, what's the rookie Hazy been like? What has the rookie <laughs> Hazy been like? Nah, he's, he's been chill. He's been chill. The, the, the tough one's been Russell Westbrook and uh, a little bit DeAndre Jordan. Uh, Russ, on, on, he made me late to, uh, to uh, our, fir our, our first road trip in the – my first road trip in the preseason. We are going to, like, Minnesota. It was, like, an hour before, you know, you're supposed to show up 30 minutes, uh, you know, before the flight leaves or whatever. Like, an hour before, he's texting me. He's like, hey, Rook, go pick up this uh, – go pick up some food from this restaurant. The restaurant's like 20, so for reference, it takes like 40 minutes for me to get to the airport. The restaurant's 20 minutes away. I'm like, gee, I'm just thinking about it. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be late. I'm going to be late and everything like that. Thank God the plane didn't leave without me, but that was, that was one of those. Yeah, but right, it's been Russ and DJ mainly. Yoke, Yoke kind of, you know, stays, in, you know, kind of likes things a certain way. Sometimes he'll ask for a couple things here and there, but he's not, he's not too bad. Um, what restaurant was it? What a restaurant it was. I honestly couldn't even tell you the name. It was somewhere in Cherry Creek, which is a nice, nice place out here. I can't think of the name right now just because it was oh, such a blur. It was such a blur of a moment. I was stressed and like, yeah, it was crazy. 
De- I, f- I feel like DeAndre Jordan's a, a good vet. I feel like he'll he'll haze you, but I feel like he's he's uh, he's seen it all, right? He's probably got yeah. a lot of wisdom. No, they're both great on on the advice thing. That's kind of the trade off. You know, you do all this stuff for him, and then you can kind of ask him questions about all that all that stuff. Now, DeAndre's been the best for me just because we're we're locker neighbors and everything, and so I get his opinion on everything. And he's you know, he's always uh, bugging me about some, uh, you know, some Stanford jokes and stuff like that. Always ask me some questions. Uh, <laughs> but no, no, he's, he's definitely an interesting guy. Currently, currently learning some Japanese and stuff like that. So he's, he's definitely a guy I'll, I'll, I'll talk to just because he, you know, likes his off-the-court stuff. And he knows I'm pretty interested in stuff off the court as well. Did DeAndre Jordan speak Japanese? No, he's taking a class. Oh, he's taking a class. Yeah, he's taking a class. Yeah, oh, that- yeah, yeah, yeah. He's both finishing, he's finishing his degree at Texas A&M and then he's, yeah, I think he's this this like Japanese class is it like some Ivy League or something I think, um, but yeah, yeah no he's 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 you know got his own stuff. That's, going. that's, a, that's a very Stanford thing to do. I f- maybe you're rubbing off on him. Yeah, maybe so. You did, did you take a language at Stanford? Yeah, I took uh, I took Spanish. Um, I kind of wish I kept it up because I I'd, I'd taken Spanish. Ah, tu hablas tu hablas español o no? Uh, un poco. It's been a, it's been a while. <laughs> okay. It's been a while because I took I took like four years and said before I went to college and then. Since then, it's like, yeah, I could probably still write at write and say it, speak at like a third, fourth grade level, maybe. But, uh, but you know, you know, you lose it, you lose it if you don't use it. So I gotta might have to get back on it. I heard that um poco, and I was like, yeah, I'm gonna have to leave it alone. That sounds like me. You know, <laughs> I was I, not getting into it right now. <laughs> no, 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 not for sure. How is how is Jokic um, as a teammate? I mean, is he is he talkative or like, well, what's what's his kind of like leadership style? It's definitely, I mean, it's definitely not a very talkative leadership style, but like when he has something to say and he needs to get it across, he'll definitely get it across. Um, but no, it's, de- it's definitely more by his, by his actions, how he, how he kind of gathers himself. And then and like, you know, it's like when you, when you know you can you need a bucket or you, like you need a play and you can go straight to, that, straight to that guy and he'll make something happen, like that's leadership in itself. Um, but no, that's like, and that's something I've kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, learned from him a little bit and kind of that leadership style or at least connected with him a little bit because like I wasn't I wasn't necessarily a rah-rah guy I was probably a little bit more talkative than he was but uh, I definitely was more you know just let the let the play on the court show it and then if I had something I really needed to get across you know make sure you get it across but but yeah that's kind of how he's kind of been you know everybody kind (laughs) of I know everybody makes the joke that you know it looks like he hates his job but uh but now he loves he loves the game and he's he's a he's a great role model so you can confirm Jokic doesn't hate his job no, no, he does not. He does not hate yeah. his job. Loves coming in the gym. No, no doubt. I could hear him. I could imagine him say, "Rook, shoot it." Thank you. <laughs> exactly. exactly. No, no, like sometimes, like if you if he throws the ball to you, it's it's almost like ninety percent because you have a shot available to you. Like if you get the ball from him, he he saw most of the time he's seeing something. You know, he's seeing something that you don't you don't see. That's incredible, man. Yeah. It's incredible. And I know you talked about Russ, you know, and his advice and the rookie hazing, but. I, uh, what is he like as a teammate on the court? So Russ is the vocal guy. Russ is extremely vocal. Like he's he's everything that Jokic isn't. That's what Russ adds up to. Like he's the guy who will always consistently bring the energy, which is crazy, considering this is like I think year 16, 17, something like that for him. You know, and his athleticism is still off the chart. His energy is still off the chart charts and like you know seeing how he takes care of his body and how he's been able to do that is something and then he's always the guy who's like you know like he gets on people if they you know walk into the door and you don't greet him and stuff like that um and yeah you know he's definitely he's he's definitely the guy who'll get on your get on your butt a little bit but he's uh he's also the nicest person off the court as well like he definitely cares for his teammates and everything like that and i always felt like the guy always got a got a little bit of bad rap and everybody always you know tries to you know with a lot of players a lot of a lot of a lot of the media gets the wrong idea about some of these guys no, for sure, for sure. I think, uh, you know, people like to to label reputations and spin narratives, but um, you know that's why we we bring on the bring the horse's mouth to come and uh, you know break some of that stuff. Um, for you, man, like let's talk about you. How has this whirlwind of a journey been, right? So you're on the two way deal, right? So some sometimes you'll be in Grand Rapids with the G League team, but the Nuggets called you up. Um, you know, you got a call the other week, right? One thirty a.m. Like get to the airport seven a.m. and then you got on the flight and then that night you played in your first NBA game. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so that was wild. So, yeah, I got, um, you know, two-way. Usually you're spending um, – it's around a third to half of your time with the G League team um, just so you can develop, you know, so you're not sitting at the end of the bench, you know, looking for these, like, three, five minutes a game that you might get. You know, it's like you're a young guy. You need to develop. You need to play. So that's why they send, send a lot of these guys, a lot of these guys down. And I, honestly, nowadays – 
a lot more teams are using the G League. Um, I think it's now, it's like last year, I think 70% of the guys drafted uh, had, saw, had seen the G League. So now it's like, if you're not a lottery pick, you're pretty much spending some time down there. And it might even be more, uh, higher percentage this year. But uh, yeah, anyways, um, training camp was starting up down there last week. So I, I went down there to go train, get familiar, familiar with the team and coach and everything. And, you know, when they told me, you know, I always try to ask, although I know it, it can flip like it can flip on a dime when you're leaving, when you're coming back. But I always try to ask and get an idea. And they told me like two weeks. So I was like, all right, I could prep for two weeks and stuff like that down there. You know, have fun playing like, you know, being a starter down there and playing like, you know, 25, 30 minutes like I was used to in college and stuff. So that was good. You know, get your, you know, get your ego back a little bit. Um, so that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, for but, sure. Uh, for but sure. yeah, no, like it was I think third, fourth day training camp. You know, I go, I go to bed pretty early, like 10, 30, 11. Um, and then, you know, I, I get a call uh, from one of our, like, player development guys. And he's, like, calling me in the middle of the night. I was like, oh, I don't really know what he's answering. So I honestly didn't answer the first call. And they called again. I was like, all right, this must be important. And he's like, hey, you're, you're, we got a flight for you at 7 a.m. Uber's coming to get you at, at 6.15. I mean, this call was at, like, 1.30 a.m. I was like, ah, shoot. I was, like, ah. I was like, okay, all right, you know. And then got my other four hours of sleep, hit the airport, uh, didn't get to Denver until, or at least to my apartment until about 12, 12, 15. And then, you know, took a nap and, you know, try to get as rest as I could. And then you had to be at the gym at like four for that, uh, seven, eight o'clock game. Um, and then, yeah, kind of rolled through it and then, you know, got some, got some plants on there at the end. So that was great. That's amazing, man. And, the, and the, these first couple of games that you've been in, man, like, has, have you had a welcome to the NBA moment yet? Not quite. Um, okay. I'm trying to think if during training camp, if there was, if there was anyone, I almost got dunked on on by Russ, but he missed it. Um, I mean, I just remember, well, my kind of welcome to the NBA moment was like during training camp where they had like the five of us, like three of us, two ways and some of the younger guys against like the five stars. And it, it, they just blew us out of the water for the first, for the first day, uh, uh, scrimmage. And then the second, the second time we, we, we adapted, but it was just like that pace and just how well connected everybody was. I mean, we didn't, we didn't score. It was like 12, zero or whatever. Um, in like a, you know, like a three minute segment or something like that. It blew us out the water. The next time we came back, we actually played a lot better, but it was like, that was the first introduction to like the pace and the IQ of all these guys. And, you know, it, it's kind of insane. Yeah, R Jokic throwing dimes, Russ talking hella shit, probably. Yeah, Russ just blowing by you. It's like, ah, oh, Jesus. Like, you know, if you're not setting that defensive stance, you got no chance. Yeah. No, that's awesome, man. That's awesome. Well, um, I'm excited to see, you know, you in the G get buckets and come in and hit big shots for, for the Nuggets, sure. man. Um, and, you know, speaking of, you know, high profile NBA players, you mentioned off camera, I'd love to bring this up again, of how the MVPA and Jalen Brown talking to you, you know, during the rookie symposium sort of about his regret, his regret off the court is like, if I wish I started earlier thinking about business off the court and, and entrepreneurship. And obviously here we, we talk a lot about business with athletes and assets and um sounds like it was really impactful man sounds like you you know some of his words still stick with you in terms of like really thinking about now even though you may have a great 10 15 year career i hope you do but even thinking about what you're doing now off the court yeah no that whole um rookie training program was 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 huge for it just because you know it's kind of impressive how much the uh, the nba invests in you know the longevity of their players and their success afterwards you know introducing us into investment opportunities, you know, kind of giving us the rundown on real estate and kind of how to be smart with your money. And some of these were actually pretty honest conversations, you know, about, you know, the lifestyle, the women, the pressure, everything like that. Like they were not afraid to go into in pretty deep with like some stark examples on some stuff, which was actually, good. actually impressive. Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, keep it real. It's just, it's literally just us. So that was great. Um, but yeah, you know, going back to like Jalen Brown and all these guys who like, you know, like, you know, especially thinking of him as like, I wish I started earlier thinking outside, especially for a guy who's, you know, like a lottery top 10 pick, you know, like you already have, you already, you know, you're already having like transformational money, you know, as long as you take care of it, you'll be fine. But all, him talking about, you know, like, you know, like, even though I have all this money, like there's still, you know, there's still stuff I'm, I'm going to want to do after I'm done. Like you, this, you know, the work ethic and everything you put into this thing isn't just going to go away. You're going to have to transfer that to somewhere else. And so thinking about where I'm going to transfer and setting that up, which just make, makes it a lot easier. And he, you know, you know, always talked about how, how many vets like kind of struggle in those first five or so years after they retire to transition because they just didn't didn't put in a decent amount of groundwork. And so kind of since then, I've kind of been um, 
looking it into my own looking into my own own kind of thing. And I did a little bit of it with Stanford, kind of you know figuring out what I wanted to get out of out of the education there and the network and the potential for that network. I didn't want that to just you know completely go to waste once I left. And I wanted to wanted to you know find a way to stay in contact with all those people I met and you know all those CEOs in Silicon Valley execs and everything like that. Like so you know I that's when I really started. Uh, keeping like a spreadsheet of everybody I met and you know I try to keep contact with stuff like that and then I've uh, increased my LinkedIn presence just to and posting on there to kind of you know stay in the you know stay in the minds of some of these people so if I need to use them later you know it's not like I'm you know coming out of the blue and then also it's just like I you know I have a couple interests in um, health tech sports tech companies entrepreneurship so kind of what I'm doing is using my brand to kind of uh, infiltrate myself into that kind of system and, and everything so it's been a, it's been an interesting process. Your, your LinkedIn, by the way, looks really good. It seems like your posts are getting some some love. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's not too bad. I, you know, we'll see where it goes. Bro, I don't understand. Like, I try to tell athletes, man, get on LinkedIn. Yeah, yeah. What are you doing, man? LinkedIn is where it's at. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a more educated audience. Yeah. Um, people aren't just fans. They're potential business partners or potential investors. Um, and the ROI of posting on there, man, come on. Like exactly. you're, I, I'm already seeing the benefits for you. I mean, like all these people in, who are influential, liking your posts, et cetera. It's just, just get on LinkedIn. I, I say, I, I, I post about this all the time, Spencer, but I'm gonna go ahead and say it again. Nah, say but, it again. Bro. No, um, no, you're definitely right. Like it's, I, that's what I found out was like, I mean, at first it's like, okay, what do you post on LinkedIn? Cause you're young. You don't, you never really, like for me, at least it was like, I'm young. Yeah. I did a couple of internships in college. I don't really have too much experience and stuff like that. And, it, and like there was just so many people like telling me just like to give a, the perspective of an athlete that is so rare to have on LinkedIn because you're constantly seeing all these professionals and stuff like that. Like that's, you know, that's what they're used to seeing. Give them a different perspective. Give them something else. Like that'll 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 take off. And I was still I was still just like because like you said, it's a more educated audience. So you don't want to come off as being like, you know, like less ed- sounding less educated, stuff like that. It's not like, you know, you're just throwing out like a TikTok or something like that where, you know, it doesn't really matter. Like, you know, this is a more of a representation of yourself. And so I think that's where some people kind of get stuck. At least that's where I, that's where I did. And then, you know, eventually after you just post a couple and, you know, you read the comments and stuff again, you're like, oh, okay, people are actually kind of interested in this stuff. So. No doubt. Here, here's what I say, Spencer, that the, MB, the MBPA probably tells you, but here's how I think about it, right? You make so much money coming in the MBA that you yourself, you turn into a business, you turn into yeah. an enterprise, yeah. the business of Spencer Jones, the business mm-hmm. of Jalen Brown. And most, most things than not are a business decision. So, yeah. you know, you alluded to you staying out of girl trouble. Well, <laughs> if you impregnate a lady that you don't like, yeah. you just gave away some equity of the company. Because <laughs> exactly. you got to play some child support. <laughs> like, right? Like, yeah, no kidding. Um, so I think, you know, you should, like, even if thinking about yourself, as an entrepreneur, even if you haven't started another company, it's like the business uh, of Spencer Jones. And even now in college, but with, with uh, more players making money with NIL, yeah. um, you know, any poor decision, man, you're just giving away equity, man. You're giving away, you're, you're letting revenue go down the drain because the revenue, your, your cash revenue is your MBA salary. Yeah. Um, so that's, yeah, so I, I, I uh, it had to be said. So for, you know, <laughs> You're staying out of trouble, getting fines. Uh-huh. Um, you you are your own business. But what I find really cool, Spencer, is um, your background and your family's background in healthcare. Correct me if I'm wrong, but your grandfather um, was one of the first African Americans uh, to work uh, in a hospital with with white white people back in the day. Can you kind of talk about your your family lineage and and why that's so important? Yeah, yeah. You know, the funny thing, the hard part about that is that uh, I didn't find out about a lot of that stuff till later. Um, you know, a lot of our family, yeah, a lot of people in my family, you know, they achieve some things, but they don't like to talk about it too much. My grandfather was one of one of them. Um, he loved talking about my sports and everything like that. But also, like, you know, like he passed uh, what my sophomore year of college, um, and like I only started really learning about that when I was like, you know, you only start learning about that stuff when like you're 15, 16. So I was like, I only had so many years to really get into it. Um, but but no like yeah it it was like in his in his funeral thing it was like so many firsts um, as a as an African American doctor but I remember him telling some stories about about like taking different routes to these hospitals like there was like a tunnel into that specific hospital I think it was like a St Luke's in Kansas City Missouri that was a you know like a, all the surgeons were were white and he was the only black surgeon he was the only one in the 
it was it was either the county, state, um, but yeah, the only the only black uh, yeah the only black surgeon operating on, on on other white people, and he had to take a different entry point into the hospital, um, and he, he would always he would always talk about that. But as you know, when you're listening to that when you're ten, you're not fully you know getting the grasp of that and everything like that, and so he. He was kind of yeah he was he was kind of the guy who we kind of put on the pedestal and everything like that and kind of set this whole higher education thing in my family. Um, you know he was the one who kind of you know although he still lived you know still loved being still loved his community and lived in lived in his community even though it probably wasn't the the safest and everything like that but he still wanted his kids to grow up in the in the community and everything like that. But then he would move. Uh, I remember he, you know he moved my dad out to uh, you know charter schools and stuff like that to learn about this higher education stuff and that. Ended up leading my dad and my uncle uh, going to my uncle who went to Stanford and my dad who went to Harvard and then you know that trickles down to my older brothers uh, you know my older brother and older sister went to high high academic universities and then you know that's kind of what helped me to you know learn about learn about Stanford and you know being from the Midwest and stuff like that you know it's kind of funny you know when I went to that school it's like yeah people know it's a decent school but don't quite know too much about it and you know the fact that I was able to be introduced into that and kind of have that as an aspiration. Set up my grades for that. Basketball also helps a little bit, especially when they're, you know, uh, only got like a 4% acceptance rates. Grades can only take you so far. Uh, so the basketball helps push you in there a little bit. But, sure. uh, <laughs> but, but yeah, that's kind of what, what started all of, all, of, all of that in higher education. And so that's, that's something, you know, I, I look at, I think about quite often um, and, you know, something I, I just think about giving back and, and you know, giving back later on, um, just about, you know, the access to, to education and, you know, just how, how people really don't strive for those kind of schools and stuff like that, just because they're not introduced to it early. And I just think about like, you know, how easily I could have, you know, stayed around the Midwest, like most of my, most of my friends did and stuff like that. So. Yeah, for sure. My guy said threes get degrees at Stanford. No, you still got to go to class, but you go four for six, brother. They go. They're gonna take it easy on the on the on the midterm. <laughs> yeah, so some some will, some will. You know, yeah. <laughs> they they you so far. No, for sure, for sure. And I bring that up because like healthcare clearly is uh, it runs in your family. It's something you're passionate about, and you're doing something, man, that I'm really excited to talk about today. So you're doing like the uh, you're kind of the new age athlete, Spencer, and how you're thinking about your off-court stuff, but also how it can influence your on-court performance. And what I mean by that is we'll, we'll dive into some specifics here, but you've been working with advising in, in, in this health, health tech, sports tech ecosystem, one, because you were interested in it, but two, because some of this technology is potentially helping you perform better on the court. Um, when did you realize that not only could you get access to companies that could help you be a better player, but also you could have, you could reap the benefits maybe long-term of, of their upside. Yeah. Um, the biggest thing started that with, it originally started with my networking, which I, like I, you know, I for mentioned that, you know, I started doing a lot more networking my last year at, at Stanford and then, you know, you get to the NBA, it's a bigger platform. So it's like, okay, you know, I could probably reach out to, you know, I feel like too many people wouldn't take my call now or something like that. No. Or have, some, have no. some interest. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, I started networking and stuff like that, the more so to learn about the healthcare industry, health tech spaces, even sports tech, and kind of learn how these companies grow, how people got in these industries and just kind of, kind of move myself towards, you know, thinking and developing for a career, you know, after, I'm, after I'm done with basketball and stuff like that. And so, so to start with that, and then it was kind of like, you know, okay, how else can I use my platform, you know, with, with NIL and everything like that, um, you know, I used it a little bit. I remember in college, I, uh, I worked kind of advising this um, training uh, startup called Instacoach that started up in uh, Silicon Valley around there, and that actually really helped with uh, with networking. But um, but yeah, it was like a, it was just like a youth training thing where I where I um, yeah I would, I would just train kids on the weekends and stuff like that, and then you know their parents would be some Silicon Valley exec somewhere, and that'd be a chance to kind of talk with them and stuff like that. And then I would also like kind of it was like my first introductions into sales. We'd do like local. Uh, pitches to you know local communities and stuff like that. One of my favorites was like a little little wine night we did with like uh, all the moms in one of the communities, and it was it was pretty fun. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I started that, and I'm like, okay, what are some health tech companies and stuff like that I can do in I can do in Denver or around and stuff like that. And so you know when you sign all these like agents and management companies and stuff like that, you know you kind of put those people to work and kind of look for these companies and opportunities and stuff like that. And so that's kind of what I've what I've done. So I'm like, you know, you're taking three percent of my contract. So it's like, you know, let's 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 try to use you use it to that fullest extent. 
And so since then, yeah, I found a, found a couple, a couple uh, companies that, yeah, like you said, have both given me an insight into how, you know, like a health tech or a sports tech company works and kind of everything you need to, need to know about it, as well as adding a benefit to some of their products helping me perform on the court. Like one of them is like a, a Healables, which is a kind of, um, you know, a, 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 <laughs> a wearable uh, that, you know, helps, helps heal your body through uh, uh, microcurrents and stuff like that. Um, and so that's, that's kind of one there where they're adapting one for my wrist as I'm, you know, getting through the last bits of my rehab after, after having had surgery after my college season. And another one's uh, Aerofit, which is just a, a, a breath training um, system product that you wear uh, during workouts and stuff like that. And they also have a mobile app that kind of uh, teaches you, you know, you know, how to use the product and, and personalizes your workouts to kind of what, what your needs are. And so, you know, like, both of those gets me healthier and, you know, gets me, you know, more in shape and stuff like that. And so it's kind of a kind of a win win there. And, you know, they get to use my platform as a, you know, as a tester, kind of bring authenticity to their products and stuff like that. And so, you know, thinking about it now, it's like, you know, why didn't I do this in, in college? Because there's a bunch of you know, there's a bunch of companies that are trying to validate their products, and it's like, you know, you're you're the perfect test case as a high level athlete, um, even in college and stuff like that. And so that's something I kind of wish I had started earlier then. But um, yeah, now with all the downtime of the NBA and stuff like that, when you're not training and you know don't have classes, you kind of can get into this stuff. No, for sure, for sure. It I, it reminds me a lot, like like you're kind of so, you know, training younger kids, and we have you know technology that helps with with injury and then you know brain you know brain function it's it's uh it's helping you it 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 kind of reminds me spencer and this is not a complete parallel comparison but when baron dave when vitamin water approached baron davis when he was playing uh he's like man i like to i like to drink man like i feel good um and he was like i think at that time kind of one of the first athletes like instead of the brand deal let me invest in the company get yeah. equity in it um and then vitamin water later got acquired by coca-cola um, yeah. you know, obviously there's a long way to go with the companies that you're ch chatting with, but I just like the, the mindset shift. Um, before we get into like the current, the healables and, and, and the game sense, I actually have a question for you. So, so Insta coach, right? Yeah. Like getting trained by your favorite athletes. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen a ton of different startups work on this problem. Oh, yeah. Is this, it essentially is. I'm a young athlete and I want to be coached by a bigger athlete or an athlete of influence. Yeah. What is your thoughts? One kind of like on the business model of this and like is Insta coach in your mind a winner? Like th there's also another company. So we had um, just for reference, Tanner, we had, I mean, it's Tanner Spencer. We had Tanner Maddox quarterback on Villanova, who is the founder of athlete squared, yeah, yeah, which is based on, yeah, it's a similar thing, yeah. Similar thing, right? What, what's, what is your thoughts on this, like, learn from a higher peer space, you know, long term? Like, is that, how's, like, what are your, what are your thoughts there? What do you think that, that market's going? I like it because of NIL um, for the sake of, you know, like, especially with Stanford, you know, we have a bunch of sports um, to where it's like, yeah, like, in you know, NIL really main, mainly the money's going to, like, the top three or four sports or whatever. I like it in the sense of like, especially Silicon Valley, it's a little bit, a little bit of different market there because you have people making a lot of money, and so your the value hourly was definitely like higher. Like, you know, I remember them telling me like when I was doing it, I was thinking it from the market of being back home in Kansas City. I was like, oh, you know, I'll get like 30, 40 bucks an hour. Like, no, no, charge a hundred. I was like, it feels a little extortion, but I mean, for the sake <laughs> of the company, I'll do it. Like, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm in it for both the, you know, sure, a little bit of cash, but also to like, you know, I kind of. Was like, hey, hey man, know your price, baby. The price I today, not it. the price yeah. yesterday. I guess it just seemed crazy high for me. But uh, anyways, like what what helped on on when I was recruiting new athletes there was like kind of talking to the coaches and also like getting email lists from coaches. I was like, look, I was like, look, it's like if I'm talking to the uh, let's say hypothetically the water polo coach at, at um, Stanford and it's like water polo is you know pretty big out out in the West Coast and everything. I'm like, look, nil is great and everything like that. You're really not going to get any money to give any of your players or anything like that, this is kind of another way to attract them. Like, hey, you know, you can train two, three kids on the weekends and get a quick 400 out here. You're not going to be able to do that, you know, at these other schools in the Midwest or whatever, even if, if a Midwest school has water polo. But for the sake, that, that was kind of a good um, enticing point there, you know, for, for more of the smaller sports. For the bigger sports, it's like now with how much these athletes are getting paid, it's, it's kind of tough. 
um, for like you know basketball and football and stuff like that. Like, is that yeah? What's their What's their motivation to do like one off? That's what I'm saying. There's, there's, there's not too time. much. There's not too much motivation there for them, just because, especially if they're at a really high schools. Like the only schools you're even beginning there is like you know maybe like a, you know the the group of five and below and stuff like that. You're not really gonna get the power five guys. I mean, I was doing it. Like I said, you know, I I I was getting you know nil and stuff like that, but I was doing it. Half for the reason of, you know, just because I enjoyed doing it. And then half for the reason of uh, the networking piece where, like, when I did it a couple times with a couple kids, I was like, oh, shoot, their parents are, you know, pretty high up. This yeah. Is yeah. You yeah. had, like, different motivations. I feel like. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You had different motivations. I feel like. Well, let me ask you. I have my opinions. But mm-hmm. do you think that in this space, you know, it feels like this is something that. Um, a company can potentially monopolize a D three, D two, um, oh, absolutely, Division three, Division two players that maybe won't get the bigger brand deals. Um, that you feel like that's where this is like the, kind of the ceiling for this. I think so. It's just gonna, like I said, you're just not gonna get the interest from the high, the high guys, just because it's it's the the time investment needed to actually train these people, and you're not gonna be able to pay them that that amount. Like it, like especially if they're getting these these deals just kind of like, you know, just somebody will hit them up on Instagram or just text their uh, NIL agent and just tell them, hey, like, there's this deal for you. Like, look, I got I got thousands of dollars just sitting on my couch not even having to do any work. So it's like, it, it, it's tough. It's like you can only access the guy, the people who are like, you know, really kind of in, in like the old college athlete kind of needing that kind of financial re- reward, you know, and that's obviously, you know, we're in the breed of the new college athlete where it's like, you know, like these people have money now. So it's like, why would I, after a long practice, a long day, or like a weekend that I finally have time off, want to go? Spend, uh, yeah, yeah want to go spend like an hour training on my feet and stuff like that. You know, when I could be recovering. So that's 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 the tough that's the tough uh, part of the market. Um, but I don't know what the the space to improve is. Maybe more on the mentorship aspects. It's like, all right, let's. What if you could just develop more of a mentoring relationship? You know, helping with mental health stuff, helping them with recruiting, helping them with all these things that you could do that don't allow for so much physical activity maybe there's that maybe there's that edge there um but yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of an interesting thing to try to navigate yeah i think i said this in a previous podcast Spencer. i think the the number one mentoring peer to peer app mm-hmm. that is going up is have you seen intro i've heard of intro yes yeah yeah that that's the one i've been seeing because like they're getting just so many high profile people to make profiles on there yeah. um who knows what we'll do long term. Um, thanks for covering that because I thought that was interesting when you brought it up. Uh, kind of getting back to uh, the sort of the, the health tech stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, Spencer, I, I saw a stat somewhere. Even though major sports leagues have a reputation of being, I don't know, kind of like old school rooted in their ways, I think I saw a, a, a stat somewhere that between 30 and 40% of the bells and whistles um, in a facility, um, more on the recovery machine side of things, are like startups, like seed yep. stage companies, particularly in the NFL. For you, spending time so far um, in the Nuggets training room, the Grand Rapids training room, um, you mentioned healables. Like, was that something you saw in the training room or something similar to it? And that that is that what prompted you to be like, oh, actually, I think I can get involved in something like this, like. Um, you know, talk to me about that. Is there any, you see, do you see innovation in the training room? Yeah. Yeah. You see innovation all the time. It's like, especially, um, over like the five years of college, like, uh, the BFR technology, um, with Hytro that, you know, Casey Tuhill was investing in, he was a old Stanford guy. Uh, you know, I just see it implemented in ev- really, I haven't seen any athlete who of the three guys who I've seen kind of have like, you know, these were like small injuries outside of our rookie who, who uh, towards uh, Achilles, but all these three guys have used uh, BFR on like almost a daily basis. Like the, the training room loves loves that, loves BFR. And that's, that, that was something and, like- and, and what does BFR stand for, for those who don't know? B, what does BFR? Why can't I do oh. this? Oh, <laughs> stumped him. All right, let me I look know, it up. I know, I know. <laughs> it's, it's like you, you, hear yeah. all these, um, you hear all these acronyms, you never really hear like the full blood, thing. Blood flow restriction. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's pretty much just like all, all it is is it's like a little strap you wrap around like your your thigh or whatever um, whatever body part or whatever you wrap it around and then all it does is like it inflates and it's literally it's literally like having uh, taking your uh, taking your blood at like the the hospital except it's like it 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 is uncomfortable it is not a 
it is not the most the most comfortable feeling. So yeah, like, yeah, yeah, they inflate them, and it's like yeah, it's like literally restricting the blood flow from your from your legs or arms or whatever. And so you're and then you just do um, your workouts or rehab exercises to make sure that the blood's you know flowing through to that injured section and hopefully hopefully to help it uh, heal faster and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I would say guys don't like it, but they like the results. Um, but anyways, yeah, you see stuff like that, like that I wasn't even doing in, um, you know, my first, second year in, in, in college, and I haven't even heard of it, you know, until maybe my, like my last year. And now it's like, it's, I, you know, if I was injured, and even, even like parts of the beginning of training camp, uh, where I was, you know, kind of, you know, needed some treatment on my wrist, like I was using it almost every day. Um, yeah, stuff like that. But with the healables thing, um, you know, it's interesting. It's like, I looked in the healables uh, a little bit just because, um, I was just interested in like, cause like the medical space, especially with the sports, um, the sports healing space, like they kind of cycle through certain treatments every like four or five years or something like that. It's like, Oh, this is back in, this is back out. It's, it's kind of wild. Um, but yeah, it's like the electro stimulation thing. It's like, I almost feel like it's coming back based on just kind of like the things they were explaining to me and everything like that. And it was also because they were like, hey, you know, we'll give you a product that's specifically custom fit for your wrist to kind of help with uh, help with its healing and its blood flow and everything like that. And so I was like, you know what, that's something I'm missing from my training room right now. It's like, yeah, I'm able to do the BFR and everything like that. But like, you know, the wrist is such a weird area. You know, you're not really going to have like a device to wrap around it perfectly and stuff like that. So to have like this kind of custom fit thing that they're working on um, was like, all right, great. And then, I, you know, I also... Also, kind of like the like deliverables and kind of all the all the things they had to say about the effects of uh, of what it does, and you know, it's like something I'm, I'm looking into, maybe potentially investing if I if I continue to continue to like the product and stuff like that. But um, yeah, so it's like there's a bunch, there's always a bunch of things that I mean, athletes especially now in the NBA, you know, you have all this money, like you have all things that are like procured like specifically for you. Like yes, they use the training room and stuff like that, but they also have like their own things. And I think that's kind of where these startups come about is like you have, you know, some high profile athletes saying like, man, this, this is the thing I tried. I love it. And, you know, I, we're, you know, uh, NBA guys are, you know, pretty superstitious people. So if you love something and you want to use it every day, you're going to use it every day. So then that yeah. kind of transfers over to, you know, the team, um, you know, developing it in, in what they use. And that's kind of, I kind of feel like that's kind of like kind of been the entry point with all this, uh, all this advancements and all this stuff kind of infiltrating. So it's been interesting. Working with the healables, uh, in these health tech companies, have you learned anything about entrepreneurship in this process of like helping them with the, the tech? I mean, it's a lot harder than you, <laughs> than you initially <laughs> anticipate, um, especially with the, the, medical, the, <laughs> the medical stuff. You know, it's like, it's like getting through compliance, getting through regulations. Um, you know, how do you establish your authenticity to your market and everything like that? Um, that itself, you know, will take it will take its time. And then just like, you know, learning how, you know, learning all the seeding functions of, of investment and everything like that, especially when they're kind of, you know, hoping you invest in the future and stuff like that. And then like, you know, going through how to deliver, you know, how to present your product through pitch decks and all, all that stuff. So it's really just like my little my little crash course in, in, in investment and stuff, um, which has been which has been great. Um, but yeah, no, I'm learning practically everything. Although I took you know, some businessy type classes at Stanford, it's you know it's one thing to actually be in it and kind of kind of see how how all of it works. Yeah, you're a management science and engineering major. Fancy way of saying, I'm not sure what. Nothing. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> I I take it as like it's it's like a you kind of like manage like um, organizational and kind of like operations. You know, so it's kind of like using. Like you take like these math classes and stuff where you get the engineering part, you take these engineering principles and try to apply it to like management operations. That's kind of how I, how like how to run a business. That's kind of how I tried to explain it to my dad who didn't understand. Yeah. Well, you have a lot of teammates who are doing some awesome things. I mean, you've probably heard of, um, I mean, I've, I don't know if you've talked to Russ, but you know, Russell Westbrook's investment portfolio, Russell Westbrook Enterprises. I mean, guys, are profil- these guys, some, these guys have done some good deals off the court. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. That's something I've, I've looked into, haven't quite yet um, asked them about it too much. I don't know. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do it too early or whatever, but that's something that I'm yeah. definitely interested in, interested in asking them about and kind of how they, how they got into it. But, uh, you know, obviously you get that big, you have all these opportunities coming, coming to you and all these, uh, you know, your network becomes, you know, where you can kind of just ask all these people to validate it and give you all these insights. And so, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm hoping to, Hoping to, hoping, to get, hoping to get my network as big as that. But no, yeah, all these guys are, you know, like you said, the entrepreneurship of the athlete is really taking off. 100%. I think uh, 
one thing that doesn't get enough coverage is actually, you know, Russ's success in uh, auto car dealerships. You should ask him about that in the Southern California yeah. area. I think it's with Toyota um, and sold his stake in that for, for a lot of money. So it's amazing what some of these guys are, are, are doing. And I think you'll, you'll, you'll be the next one, man. Um, have you ever thought about building a health tech startup yourself one day? I mean, I have thought about it. You know, I just, I know there's a huge learning curve, which I'm trying to slowly, slowly diminish through the, through the years of, of learning all this. But, uh, but yeah, no, I, there's definitely, I, just, I mean, I, it's kind of been the dream outside of making the NBA and, you know, now it's the dream of staying in the NBA. The, the dream after that would be, yes, running my own business, running my own startup. That's actually, you know, impactful as well. Like, you know, hopefully I'm, you know, after I'm done with my playing career, I, uh, you know, I won't be thinking much about uh, finances and money and stuff like that. Hopefully that'll be all squared away. So then it's just like, you know, what am I going to be proud of making an impact, um, you know, while also kind of like running my own thing. No, no doubt, man. No doubt. Well, I love where your head's at, man. Really, really appreciate you joining us, man, in the early part of your, your career. But we'll have to have you on again, Spencer, and, and see where you are in like six months, a year from now when uh, really? you have like abundance of enterprises and now you can, you know, <laughs> like chat about them. Yeah, no doubt, man. This has been another great episode of the Athletes and Assets podcast. I've been your host, Noah Lack, talking to Denver Nuggets rookie Spencer Jones, a little business, a little health tech. Spencer, man, best of luck this evening. Go kill it. Go hit, knock down some threes, and we'll see you soon, man. Welcome to the community. All right. Thank you so much. Pleasure to be a part of it. No doubt. No doubt.